Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be back in Trieste, actually. I, I realized uh, <clears throat> I haven't been here for 11 years, and just seeing A.D. Gava reminded me of the good old days in the 90s when I came here basically every year because I was one of the organizers of the spring school and have very fond memories of that. And I also want to thank the organizers of the Exactor G conference for in, for an invitation, it gives me a chance to meet some of the people whose papers I've been reading. Uh, okay, so uh, so the title of my talk is uh, is this, and uh, just just a couple of years ago, I started wondering about UV fixed points, and I was actually led led to it through some adventures in so-called higher spin ADS CFT correspondence, which. I'll mention very briefly. Uh, and then actually with Simone Jombi, uh, who is a, an assistant professor at Princeton and uh, a couple of excellent graduate students, we've done a whole bunch of calculations. Some of them are not entirely original, but uh, I'll share them with you anyway. Uh, so so this, this is uh, the incomplete set of various papers. Uh, uh, and uh, in the first part of the talk, I'll mainly talk about the, the gross nouveau conformal field theory. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll be a bit more adventurous and talk about the ON model above four dimensions, which is a somewhat less clear topic. Uh, okay, so the gross nouveau model, it crops up a lot, uh, in particular in this conference. In two, uh, so Gross and Nevo's original paper was in uh, two dimensions, and the idea was that it, it's a kind of nice toy model for four-dimensional QCD in the sense that this coupling in two dimensions is asymptotically free. Uh, just to explain notation, I'll mainly work with four-component Dirac fermions for reasons that you'll see in a second. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, and uh, it's asymptotically free, but it's, it doesn't give a CFT in the infrared because there is a dynamical mass generation. Uh, now, there is, uh, the physics is somewhat similar to the two-dimensional two ON nonlinear sigma model with N bigger than two. Uh, <clears throat> and now we're interested in going slightly above two dimensions where both the ON and the gross nouveau models have weakly coupled UV fixed points, uh, and then they essentially become conformal field series. Thing uh, is not switching. Uh, am I pressing? Oh, okay, okay, it's just, uh -huh. oh, I can use this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so just to remind you, the beta function uh, for, the, for the ON model, uh, <clears throat> there is this negative term. This is for, for the gross nouveau model. There is a, a term which is negative for N bigger than two, and N is uh, for an F in our notation. It's also the number of two-component two Majorana fermions, which is the minimal number of fermions. So our n just basically measures the number of fermionic degrees of freedom. When this number is bigger than two, you have a asymptotic freedom in 2D, but then slightly above 2D, you have a perturbative UV fixed point. Uh, and, uh, and this was appreciated, I think, uh, soon after the Grosnev original paper. And uh, a bunch of people long ago developed two plus excellent expansions for various operator dimensions, and then here are the answers. You actually notice one interesting thing is that uh, all the perturbative corrections vanish for n equal one. This is just the bare dimension of psi, uh, and these are vanishing perturbative corrections, and this is the bare dimension of sigma plus perturbative corrections. Uh, so, uh, so sigma is just psi bar psi. So for n equal one, something special happens to this model, and I'll come back to this uh, somewhere a bit later. Now, there are similar expansions in the, 
ON sigma model with n bigger than 2, which is also asymptotically free. But that model is a bit more complicated because there are infrared divergences in, uh, due to the sca uh, scalar fields. Uh, now, uh, 4 minus epsilon, so uh, the upper critical dimension, as you push above 2, uh, the upper critical dimension is 4. And of course, the uh, ON sigma model is in the same universality class as the Wilson Fisher ON model, which is just the 5 4 theory with. Or in invariant interaction, and in four minus epsilon dimensions, it has a weakly coupled Wilson Fisher now infrared fixed point. And uh, so, using the two uh, epsilon expansions, the four minus epsilon and two plus epsilon, one can actually uh, derive excellent uh, uh, approximations to the critical exponents in d equal three. Uh, they're not as excellent as the bootstrap values that uh, Slava told us about yesterday, but, but they nevertheless played a, a very important historical role. And for example, in, in uh, Kleinert and Schulte Frölinde's book, uh, it's done up to five loops and you get very good values and the field is still not standing still. Uh, there is now a six loop apparently available. Uh, so, so it's been... Uh, a great, uh, great way to approximate things, even though the epsilon, the summation of epsilon expansion is, of course, a bit of a, it's not an exact science, but it still helps a lot. Uh, now, the gross Nouveau model. So the question is, what is the UV completion of the gross Nouveau model? Namely, how do you flow to it from above rather than from below? Uh, and the answer, actually, it's something I didn't know till I started working on related things and kind of guessed the answer. But it turned out that it was in the literature since 91. In fact, then just 10. And independently, Hazen Fratz, Hazen Fratz Janssen, Kuti, and Shen, uh, and Shen uh, basically realized that it's just the multi-flavor Yukawa model. And now people often call it the gross Nouveau Yukawa model. So you basically, it has the same symmetries. It has a, it's renormalizable in four dimensions. It, these are the two renormalizable couplings in four dimensions. But now the difference is that as you go slightly before, uh, slightly below four dimensions, these become now slightly irrelevant as opposed to slightly irrelevant. So this model has, it's a little bit harder to calculate with because uh, there are now two couplings. So you need two beta functions for two couplings. Uh, uh, and the, so these are the beta functions up to two loop order. Uh, these were actually done in, uh, in a paper by Karkine and, in collab and collaborators in 93, and we re-derived them and rechecked them. And the, so you see uh, some interesting things like the appearance of the square roots and the fixed point values of the coupling. Uh, and these are the, the couplings up to the order that we need. Uh, and then you can derive the operator scaling dimensions. So now sigma basically stands for psi bar psi. In the gross Nouveau model, you get this number. Then you get uh, psi dimension. And also another interesting dimension is the sigma squared operator. So using the two, again, using the two uh, expansions, the four minus epsilon and two plus epsilon, you can actually construct good values b between two and four. And now, the actually, two plus epsilon expansion is under better control uh, because there are no infrared divergences. So, so here is, uh, there is one thing you carry from this talk. Many of, the, of you know this already, is this picture. that uh, So we have this interacting CFT, which in D equals three is basically strongly coupled and non-perturbative. Uh, it's wedged between two free CFTs. You can either flow to it from, so the directions of the flow lines are like this. This is uh, from UV to IR, right? This is, so you can either start with a f the, the usual gross Nouveau model is uh, sort of this part. So from the point of view of N free fermions, you have to add an irrelevant interaction and you get here. But uh, there is also a way to flow down to this model from the free CFT of N free fermions plus one scalar. And the nice thing is that, 
So as you uh, vary dimension, when D gets close to four, this fixed point basically slides near here, and you can do perturbations here and near here. When, you, when D becomes close to two, you can do perturbations here and near here. And of course, D equals three is the desirable case, but you have really very good control from, uh, from uh, epsilon, these two epsilon expansions, and also one over n expansion is another a good thing about which there are many things known. Uh, and here is an example of another quantity that we recently calculated, and this is a completely new calculation. Uh, it's uh, the so-called CT, the coefficient of the two-point function of two stress energy tensors. Uh, it's determined by conformal invariance, and here, here is the result uh, of, of our, of our sort of resumed epsilon expansions as a function of D. Uh, it's a pretty interesting result because you see that uh, actually, so this is uh, N times CT over CT3 minus one. So when it dips below, below zero, that means that CT actually increases when you flow from the UV to IR. And some people worry about whether CT always decreases under RG flow. This is actually, strangely enough, violated very near, very near two dimensions, but in three dimensions it's not violated. So it actually does decrease under the usual RG. Uh, but then there is another measure of degrees of freedom, which is uh, essentially what uh, uh, Calabrese just talked about this morning. <coughs> it's related to entangle, uh, a particular kind of entanglement entropy. Uh, in two plus one dimensions. Of course, uh, he mainly talked about one dimension where there is no shape dependence. But when you start looking in two spatial and one time dimension, uh, then you are on a plane. And the simplest type of region is, uh, well, people often talk about just the half plane entanglement entropy, but uh, more informative in a way is the circle. Namely, you draw a circle of radius r, and uh, you compute the entanglement entropy between inside and outside of the circle. And then there is uh, the area law here is just the perimeter law. That's a non-universal term. And then there is a subleading universal term, which uh, you often see denoted as gamma in the gapped system. It's so-called topological entanglement entropy. But uh, we started calling it F. Uh, and uh, for reasons uh, that... Um, Essentially, <clears throat> in this case, there is an amazing trick of calculating this. So for this particular shape and in a conformal field theory, you don't need the replica trick. You, you can just map it using, you can essentially map this region to the sitter space and think about it as a the sitter entropy. And Euclidean the sitter is just a three sphere. So, so this F is just minus the log of a partition function of the Euclidean CFT on a three sphere. So if you will, it's a kind of trick that allows you to compute the entanglement entropy in a very simple way. <clears throat> and uh, uh, <clears throat> so there is something that uh, actually <clears throat> in a paper with uh, Jafaris, Pufu, and Savdi, we called the F theorem, namely that when you flow from the UV to IR, uh, uh, FUV is bigger than FIR. So this is what's called the F theorem in uh, three dimensions, and it's believed to be a kind of analog of the Zamolochikov C theorem in two dimensions and the Cardi A theorem in four dimensions. And to flesh out this fact, actually, John B and I a couple of years ago considered this quantity in continuous dimension, like in the spirit of how we consider the CFT in continuous dimension, we can do the same on this <coughs> for the sphere free energy. Then it's convenient to define this quantity sine pi d over two times log z. Uh, the reason you need this something like this is because f actually blows up near even dimensions due to wild anomalies. So, for example, in four minus epsilon dimensions, you see like a one over epsilon pole. Uh, and same in two dimensions. It's really due to the fact that there is then a log r term. There is a logarithmic term in radius of this region. Uh, so when you kill this off, you, 
uh, you, f you find that the result is a, is a completely smooth function of dimension. So this F tilde thing uh, looks like this. So here is a result for free theory. So what are the simplest CFTs in the world? They're just a conformally coupled scalar field or a massless fermion. And these are the, uh, you have to trust me on this, it takes a little while to derive these integral representations. But you can recognize some familiar numbers for while anomaly. So for example, this F tilde in even dimensions is just pi over two times the A anomaly value. And uh, so you, you see, for example, like, you know, for a scalar, it's 190, and you indeed see pi over 180. The blue line is the scalar, and the red line is the fermion. And it's a completely smooth function. Uh, of dimension. It doesn't exhibit any features. It seems to monot monotonically drop off as a function of dimension. So now that, that's the easy thing to compute just for free fields. But then uh, we did perturbation theory in, in the interaction. So for example, for the Wilson-Fisher model, you just perturb by phi to the four interactions. And, uh, and you have to do integrals over the d-dimensional sphere. This actually gets very hairy, and, uh, but now there is software that allows you to do these integrals. The really hairy part is that there are also, in addition to the usual renormalization of coupling constant, you also have to add one over epsilon poles multiplying the Euler number. Like there is the so-called curve, because you're in curved space, so you have, to, you have divergences proportional to curvature squared terms. Anyways, after many months of computation, you get the following four minus epsilon expansion for the ON Wilson Fisher model, actually up to epsilon to the fifth. Uh, and, uh, and it's actually, is amazingly informative. When you look at the numbers, you see that the leading interaction corrections are very small. Uh, and, uh, and you essentially find that, uh, you find that <coughs> For example, for the 3D easing model, at the interacting fixed point, this F is only 2% lower than the, uh, than the free scalar. So the easing model is just the 5-4 theory, so you flow from a free scalar to this model. I used to worry a lot, like when we wrote this paper about the F theorem um, over five years ago, I worried, how do you test this? Uh, and uh, and for example, what if like the easing model result overshoots and becomes negative, which would be really bad too. It turns out that it's extremely close to free field value. Uh, and this is not too unusual because even the dimension of the phi field at, in, at the easing fixed point is only like 3.6% away from free field value, but this is even closer. Uh, okay, so. So now we did uh, the same thing for the gross nevu CFT. There is a four, uh, in this case, there is nice four minus epsilon expansion, and there is a nice two plus epsilon expansion. Uh, so it's it, exactly the kind of thing that's the easiest to pade. You basically construct polynomials that match onto the information both near 2D and 4D. Uh, and these are the plots as a function of D for this F tilde. Uh, for the F tilde minus N of the free fermion, and you see that it's always positive. So, so this F theorem is satisfied not just in 3D, but for all dimensions. And, uh, and I, it also matches onto a large N computation, which is easy to do, which I will not describe here. Uh, okay, so here is a summary of the results uh, on 3D gross nevu CFTs. Uh, as a function of, of this number n of the fermionic components. This is not entirely new. Of, I mean, there were other related papers, but I hope we did a more complete job. Uh, actually, uh, there was a paper about n equal 8 just the other day by John Gracie and, uh, and collaborators who were actually a bit off on one of their estimates. But, uh, but so you, these are the plots as a function of n. This is n equal 2, 3, 4, uh, and so on, the values in this table. 
you see that at large n, everything matches on nicely to the large n results. Uh, and now let me, uh, so, so basically, we've succeeded using this sort of traditional RG, just resummation of different perturbative limits to get some hopefully good information about this CFT. And of course, this can be compared with exact RG results and can be compared with conformal bootstrap results, which I think the work is underway uh, by conformal bootstrap. There already was an interesting paper, but I think there is more work underway. Uh, and now let me talk about the special thing, n equal one, which is, as I mentioned, it's a very strange limit from the point of view of the gross nevu model, because if you take just the two component by Rana, psi bar psi squared it just vanishes. So there is no way to write this model as a four fermion theory. But there is a way to write it as a Yukawa model. So in this case, the, one of the formulations just trivializes, but there is still a Yukawa formulation. Uh, okay, and in this case, actually, it's a simple model for something people call emergent supersymmetry. It's just an example of how uh, in the IR there can be enhanced symmetry. So this minimal 3D Yukawa theory for one two-component Majorana and one pseudo-scalar field uh, was conjectured to have emergent supersymmetry, I believe for the first time by Scott Thomas in, in an unpublished seminar in 2005 uh, at KITP, or maybe 2006, but somewhere around then. But he never wrote the paper. Actually, his slides are quite informative, but uh, I found them easier to read than some of the subsequent papers. But, uh, but then, uh, so the amazing thing about this model is that the fermion mass is forbidden by the time reversal symmetry. So all that you need to do to reach the CFT is a single tuning of the sigma field mass. And then it's alleged that you're automatically getting a supersymmetric model. So this could be an example of how something supersymmetric can show up, not at LHC, but in some sort of condensed matter system. Uh, and indeed, uh, there have been uh, some attempts to at the condensed matter realization at the boundary of a topological insulator. So essentially, you can take the UV Lagrangian to be this minimal kind of Wasamino model in three dimensions for the n equal one superfield. And uh, this is the bootstrap paper, uh, but they actually didn't have a particularly robust indication of this uh, fixed point, although once you look at it, it's sort of in agreement with what I'm about to show you. <coughs> so now, so what happens uh, in this n equal one case, then uh, for, as I said, you cannot use two plus epsilon expansion at all. It just trivializes, all corrections are zero. That just means that this models uh, in two dimensions, it's not a weakly interacting theory. It's actually, I'll show you what theory it is. It's a well-known minimal model. It's a strong, still stays strongly interacting even in two dimensions. But it is weakly interacting in four minus epsilon dimensions. And one sign of things happening for good things happening for n equal one is that the square root actually equals 13. Uh, it's not some uh, irrational number, which turns out to be a lucky 13. And then you plug in this 13 and you see that the two couplings are actually related uh, by a factor of three, which is a sign of this, uh, what you see in the Wesemina model so it's consistent with emergent SUSY relation, and perhaps even more strikingly, all the different looking dimensions start just differing by one half, up to two loop order. Uh, so this is, uh, in Scott Thomas' paper, he had like this part, and it actually wasn't clear how he was even doing the four minus. You have to realize that this n equal one limit is a little bit formal, because if you start in four dimensions with a Majorana, you have to kind of take half of a Majorana. But this trick works very well. I mean, it wasn't emphasized by anyone writing these papers before, but we kind of, once we started doing this, we realized that this is what needs to be done. And strangely enough, it works perfectly. You see these uh, one loop and two loop corrections lining up. So uh, consistent with the SUSY relation, uh, and it's nice that we see it order by order in epsilon expansion, 
So of course, it's tempting to conjecture that this is exactly true everywhere below four dimensions. And it would be nice to test at higher orders in epsilon. I'm sure an ex so there are some ex uh, experts who can do Yukawa theory at three loops and maybe four loops, but we haven't done it. And, but we're fairly sure that the, these miracles will continue to hold. Uh, now, Pade to d equals three gives delta sigma, which is this value. And it seems close to the bootstrap result properly interpreted, but I think there is more bootstrap work on. The thing is, when you do bootstrap, you have to assume something about the dimension of the next operator. And, and where you are depends on what you assume about that. We actually know what the dimension of next operator is from our epsilon expansion. And if you look at that point in the curve, it seems to agree pretty well. Uh, but another amusing thing is this continuation to d equal two. Uh, it gives an interacting superconformal theory, and it's actually just a tricritical easing model, which has a central charge. Now, one of the beautiful things about this f quantity is that when you continue it to d equal two, it literally becomes the central charge up to some factor of pi over two. So we can, using the extrapolation of f, that I, this quantity, the sphere free energy, we can figure out what the central charge of the model is. And the epsilon, uh, the epsilon expansion just gives us 0 0.217, which is amazingly close to 1 fifth, which is the exact value. Uh, sorry, sorry, the, this is for the, for the dimension of sigma. And for f over f scalar, it's even closer. It's 0 0.68, while c is 0.7. So one can track these operators uh, from four all the way to two dimensions, and, and it looks like the, there is a set of models with emergence of persimmetry everywhere in between. Uh, okay, are there maybe any questions about this? Or, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. I think they're pretty. I think they're pretty close. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, the, there were. Yeah, I may not know all the literature well enough, but the, there were in particular estimates for n equal eight. Uh, for example, in a paper by uh, Herbert and Janssen, and we actually just recently checked that they're uh, close to that. Although they, they were also part of what they were doing is also like this GNY model, the gross Nevuyukawa and some use of that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it would be really fun to compare. I mean, we have this table f with the literature that we have found. Uh, I think these tend to be in good agreement. This n equal eight is a rather special value which many people studied because it's a, supposed to be realizable in condensed matter. Um, so, uh, okay. So now, uh, so when n is large, this is, uh, this is actually how I got into this stuff in the first place. Uh, so Polyakov and I conjectured in 2002 that Essentially, the special thing about these large N, ON, and GN models is that they have an infinite number of approximately conserved higher spin currents in the sense that in free fields, they are exactly conserved and the flow makes them still, does not destroy this conservation. And it means that all the anomalous dimensions of these currents are of order one over N. Uh, and that's just what you need to build an interacting sort of an ADS dual in D plus one dimensions. So, so there is something called Vasiliev theory in ADS four. I should say it's a different Vasiliev from the one who did the, uh, the large N calculations in that model. Uh, so, so this is Misha Vasiliev and he, he wrote some beautiful papers in the early nineties on uh, just higher spin gravity, found some formulation in ADS four. Uh, and uh, by now there is a set of checks of this duality. 
Uh, so, so this kind of gives another motivation. So by studying these models, you're supposedly learning something about quantum gravity in ADS space. But it's a rather special theory of quantum gravity, which, which contains all these higher spin fields in addition to spin two uh, graviton field. Now, <clears throat> so the ADS-CFT relation for the dimension uh, of the scalar operator versus the mass of the field is just this. It's a very simple relation. And you can have bo basically both the delta plus and delta minus values for some negative values of m squared. I should say that negative m squared in ADS space is not necessarily unstable. It just has to be above the brighton lohner friedman bound. This is a very famous result in ADS space, the brighton lohner friedman bound. And uh, in this range, you can take both of these dimensions. And actually, if you look in ADS4, say for the gross neveu model, there are two values, delta equal one and delta equal two. And one of them corresponds to interacting theory and the other one to uh, free theory. <clears throat> so, so this is, and the same thing happens for this, uh, for this uh, interacting ON model. So it's a very promising thing to start comparing the one over n expansions. Uh, <clears throat> so now I'm going to make a transition to something a bit more speculative. Like the, the gross neveu model is uh, like, it definitely makes sense, I think. And it, it makes sense for all values of n. Uh, and hopefully there will be more experiments. Yeah, we've also done work on QED3, which there is still a question whether it's a CFT for very low values of n, but, but there is a similar story at large values of n. But then, so you build the one over n expansion by using the hubbard stratonovich auxiliary field, for example, in the ON model. Uh, and this you ignore at the fixed point. That's the sort of old method of, uh, uh, which I don't know who applied it first, maybe Ken Wilson. But then it was really pushed forward by Vasiliev and collaborators in, in the Leningrad group. And <clears throat> so, so you get like this, the, the nice thing is that you get a non-local effective action for the sigma field, and there is a kind of induced dynamics. You see the, this uh, non-local propagator emerging, and then when you transform it back to position space, you see that the sigma field has dimension two up to one over n corrections, which is the right value of dimension. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can build the one over n expansion for the dimension, for example, of the phi field. Just to make it clear, now I'm talking about the ON model. I'm no longer talking about the gross neville. I'm talking about the ON model. Uh, so the dimension of the phi field will have the free value plus one over n, one over n squared corrections. And people uh, persevere to compute these functions as a function of d. Like, so you know, for example, this eta one, here is its explicit form as a function of d. Uh, so it's a kind of non-perturbative thing, where it, it requires a certain diagram or summation, and it's actually known up to order one over n cubed, where it starts, the formula get like half a page long, and they involve all sorts of special functions. And, uh, in fact, some of these old papers on top of everything had typos, and so it's a bit of a, takes some work to get into this field. It took us quite a while to sort this out. But one of their big tests was that you can compare <coughs> with four, mi <coughs> four minus epsilon expansion. Sorry. <coughs> So here is something that is evident in this result, even for the leading one over n. So if you plot this as a function of d, uh, this is what you see. It's positive between two and four. And if it, once it goes negative, you clearly see that the large n theory is non-unitary because, because this, uh, this is just the unitarity bound, right? So if this is, uh, becomes negative, then you know for sure that a theory at very large n is already non-unitary. Uh, but uh, luckily, it's clearly positive here. And of course, we all know that Wilson-Fisher theory is unitary and nice between two and four. But then it's again positive between four and six. And then 
Above six, it really goes non-unitary. And the two-point function coefficient C is, has similar properties. And we actually, for reasons of this uh, studying higher spin theory, we wanted the 5D theory to be sort of okay, like to still be at least unitary at large n. And this is actually how we started worrying about the five-dimensional ON model. Uh, so, so we started thinking, could there be actually some kind of ON model formulation between four and six dimensions, which is at least at large and unitary. And at first it seems a little crazy because like you open Michael Peskin's quantum field theory book and he immediately tells you, don't look for scalar theories above four dimensions, they're all trivial, right? Uh, so you would need some kind of a UV fixed point of, of this model, but then when you start doing Actually, I didn't find it myself, but Parisi told me that he wrote a paper in 75 on non-renormalizable interactions and literally discussed this model. Uh, and this is sort of an old topic. Like if you go to four plus epsilon dimensions, you see that there is a UV fixed point, but it's at negative coupling. And negative coupling, uh, it seems weird, but it's not deadly at large n, right? You, you can have a theory sort of uh, sitting at the top of the potential at large n and still be sort of okay. Uh, so our goal was mainly to study the theory in five dimensions because there is some indication of the existence of, of higher spin theory in ADS6, which would be dual to this five-dimensional uh, theory. And then we <coughs> started sort of thinking about what could be the UV completion of this uh, uh, this non-renormalizable theory, and arrived at this, uh, and this we did independently uh, for what it's worth. I mean, I don't think it's very profound, but we, we haven't found literally papers on this, so it's surprisingly. So it's just a version of uh, O-N symmetric cubic scalar theory, and by, uh, quite analogously to the gross Navuyukawa model, you have to add an additional scalar field and write the model with sigma phi i phi i term and sigma cube term. <coughs> Actually, we realized this before we even knew about the gross Navuyukawa model, but, and then we started playing with the beta functions. So this was about two and a half years ago or more. We started playing with the beta functions and we saw that uh, there is an IR stable fixed point. There is a real solution uh, in six minus epsilon dimensions provided n is very large. So, so if n is above 1038, there is a solution. If n is below 1038, it goes complex, which is a pretty, tip. so if you draw the two, like there are two curves that intersect when n is bigger than 1038, uh, and, uh, and uh, so this is the IR fixed point of this cubic theory, uh, but then the intersection disappears. And that's a pretty typical situation that you can encounter. Like the, there are two fixed points that merge when n hits this critical value and then they go off to a complex plane. And they, but uh, it's sort of nice that for large n, everything matches with the large n philosophy because there we could use just this large n philosophy. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, so then you can do all sorts of perturbative checks with large n and they all agree. And I should say that the, the model is quite different from the original phi cube model uh, in six minus epsilon that Michael Fisher studied in 78. He studied the n equals zero version. In that case, the fixed point set at an imaginary value. And that was manifestly non-unitary but stable. Manifestly non-unitary but it's actually stable because the path integral just oscillates. And he did it, he managed to estimate the Li-Yang edge singularity by continuing from six to two dimensions. Uh, and this was before the exact solution of uh, Bilavin, Palakov, Zamolochikov was known. So, uh, so this, uh, this was a kind of historic paper. And, but then we realized that there is a totally different sort of thing where N is large and the solutions are real. Uh, and then we did the three loop analysis. The beta functions get complicated. 
But then the nice thing is that we can match the six minus epsilon expansions of, uh, because you see, you, you know these in arbitrary dimension from the work of, of Vasilio et al. And you, and you see that our six minus epsilon perturbative expansion exactly reproduces these. So if you will, it kind of gives you a new cross check on both the large N formula and the fact that the theory is like the UV completion of the ON model. And then John Gracie did it even at for loop and it continues to work. So, uh, <clears throat> so it's pretty uh, non-trivial checks because you can compare many, many coefficients here. You can go like, so the large N formula worked to all orders in epsilon. Our formula worked to order epsilon cube but to all orders in one over n. And then you can compare the, between some set of the two coefficients. But then the question is, uh, could there be, <coughs> uh, what happens in 5D? And that of course gets non-perturbative and then one can try to do uh, exact RG or some other approaches or one can try to resum the epsilon expansion and if one just naively proceeds by computing one of epsilon corrections, you do see that 1038 gets corrected downwards twice pretty sizably by the two epsilon corrections. So if you just plug in epsilon equal one, you, you get down to a fairly low value, but then John Gracie's value, I didn't show it here, is positive and largish. So it's basically hard to tell, but there is a kind of, uh, elephant hiding in this closet, which is, does it even make sense to talk about critical N for this model because it's just a cubic model, right? So, so the path integral is not maybe strictly well defined. So does the theory make sense non-perturbatively? So we, we actually did some work on this, but never so far haven't written it up, but we believe that at least uh, the, the vacuum at, <coughs> at uh, phi equals zero and sigma equals zero is metastable because uh, you can use standard instanton methods to compute tunneling. Like when you're in six minus epsilon dimensions, you can just do perturbative RG and the potential should be close to, to the bare potential. And the potential just looks like this, right? It just looks like this. Uh, so you, to compute tunneling, you need an instant town that goes from here to here. And it's not hard to get this exact solution. In fact, it's in a paper by uh, Alan McCain from long ago, but we had to adapt it to this large end setting. And essentially you find that the model is at least metastable with a long lifetime when N is large and epsilon is small. So the danger is that you can pick up imaginary parts due to this instant on of order e to the minus n over epsilon, but we haven't fully finished this project. So we don't know for sure that these imaginary parts really spoil the game. Uh, uh, and then there was, uh, I guess we will hear in the next talk about some of the work from exact RG, which also suggests some uh, possibly metastable solution. And then there was some work from conformal bootstrap directly in 5D, and uh, it's fairly recent paper, and it actually looks fairly encouraging for the existence of some model in five dimensions. So they looked at n equal 500, which is about half the value, the critical value in 6D, and they get these islands, the, the type of islands that Slava reviewed in his talk that are definitely there and, and shrinking for the equal 3ON model. So you get similar types of islands and the large N result, which is the only thing you can easily do for this model, sits right in the middle of this island. So, so it looks like this, uh, uh, these islands are kind of shrinking around wh where you think the scaling dimension should be according to the large N approximation. Uh, it would be very interesting to pursue this further and see if this is, if these islands keep shrinking and how precise this is. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so, so the, so let me conclude. Uh, so I've talked about some adventures in 
in what seems to be the method of yesteryear, which is time-honored method. I, uh, this was long before my time in the field, but I was told that the Wilson Fisher paper was quite a breakthrough because it gave a kind of quantitative tool to, to approximate theories. Uh, and it happened to work very well for the ON model. Granted, it doesn't always work very well, <laughs> but, but it appears to continue to work well for gross Nouveau model. Our paper uh, also considered the nambuyan Alessinio model, which is similar to gross Nouveau, but it has an extra U1 symmetry. Uh, and then there are other vectorial CFTs to which one can apply it. So why is this useful? Uh, well, uh, Slava uh, quoted my uh, friend uh, Polyakov saying that RG is a human-made thing, but I mean, it's good it was made <laughs> at some point. So, uh, so it's certainly, you know, it's hard to be no, for sure, outside perturbative region, but, and you can miss some theories, but when it works well, it really tells you where the theory is. And then this is, for example, a, a sign of like, so here the RG tells you that this is where the theory is. And uh, so in the cases so far where Bootstrap was successful, it, it does agree with RG, uh, at least in almost all the cases. Uh, maybe Bootstrap gives more precision. So I think these studies of RG give you a way to pinpoint where the theories might be and facilitate the life of people doing Bootstrap because they can tune things to, uh, to find these theories more precisely. I also talked about the RG inequalities like C theorem, I theorem, and F theorem. They all give you a quantity uh, which if, if a CFT, if a short distance CFT flows to a long distance CFT, uh, it, something is supposed to decrease. Now, in two dimensions, I'm logic of proof in, in 87, that I vaguely remember. Uh, at first, it wasn't clear how much of a breakthrough it was, but it kind of set the gold standard for, uh, for these theorems. And then for A theorem, there is a, uh, conjecture by Cardi from 88, and then a recent proof by Kamargotsky Schwimmer. For F theorem, uh, there were conjectures a few years ago by our group and by Rob Myers, and then was proved by Cassini and Huerta. And now what I show to you is a kind of possible interpolation between all these theorems, just by studying spheres in continuous dimension, because all these theorems actually come from spheres in continuous dimension, and you can interpolate from A to F uh, using this, uh, these sphere calculations, and, uh, and also like these, these things are useful for ADS-CFT, where in addition to graviton, there are higher spin fields. Now, uh, some small values of N can be very special because there are enhanced infrared symmetries. For example, for Yukawa CFTs, uh, one can exhibit emergent supersymmetry. In the gross nevu yukawa model, one sees it for minimal number one Majorana fermion. We also have results, uh, uh, well, they're also not fully ours, but revisited by us at two-loop order, by, where you take a complex scalar and, uh, and a Dirac fermion, and then you have more control because there is a, a kind of U1 R symmetry. So you can see these emergent symmetries for low values of N. <coughs> and then more speculatively, we found uh, a possibility of ON models in uh, D between four and six, uh, which I believe are at least uh, metastable. And uh, what does it mean? No one is completely sure yet. But uh, I think one possible interpretation is that that there are small imaginary parts to the scaling dimension, which means that there is no true second order phase transition, but the transition could be very weakly first order. And if that's the case, maybe that can be seen in actual simulations. So, so there have been other approaches to the 5D ON model other than our 
attempts to do it via epsilon expansion, uh, namely conformal bootstrap and exact RG. And I'll just end with a question. <coughs> Like, uh, could the phase transition in 5D be very weakly first order for large n? I don't think anyone really simulated n very large for ON magnets in five dimensions, but uh, I think if we are right that there is some kind of metastable theory, maybe that's what happens. But Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs> mm -hmm.